Mr. Bill Gates, thank you so much for your time. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation just released its 2019 Goalkeepers Report uh, to keep track on progress made on the SDGs. First of all, why was it important for the foundation to, to take that role on keeping the track on the SDGs? Well, I hope everyone is tracking these sustainable development goals, but often in the richer countries, there's a lot of distraction. And so the opportunity once a year to take this general assembly meeting and say, okay, during this week, let's take this report card that all the countries agreed to and see how we're doing. Are there some heroes we should talk about? Are there some things that went better than we expected? Where are we falling behind? Uh, we get several hundred people we call goalkeepers and we try and energize them. These are uh, people who are working on the goals in innovative ways. They want to meet each other. Uh, they want to hear from leaders and we celebrate what's gone on while making sure, because we're very numeric, uh, that we do a report that really reminds us uh, that as much progress as we're making, you know, a child in many countries uh, still over 10% are dying before the age of five. And in richer countries, it's less than 1%. So the idea that any place in the world is still 10%, some almost 15%, that's outrageous and it should galvanize us to do a better job. This is the third edition of the Goalkeepers Report. What did you find significant this, this year? Well, the big thing we did this year is we not only looked at each country and saw, okay, what's the progress on education and health uh, during the last 20 years? We even went within the country. So we did at what we call the district level, and we saw that even there, uh, if you didn't have a collapse or a war, uh, health and education have improved. So progress is happening almost everywhere, but we saw that within a country you have these huge differences. Uh, you know, the best part of India is like a rich country, the worst part of India is like a, a really poor, poor country. Uh, within Nigeria you have huge differences. Uh, and so Hopefully that's inspiring to say, okay, what's well, going well in the good part of the country and how do we accelerate a conversion because you, know, you can use the federal budget to help with dollars, you can use the ideas there. In some ways it should be easier to spread best practices within a country than it is between countries. We need to do both. Uh, and Africa has, if you look at each area, it has a lot of exemplars and it has some uh, where things uh, have not progressed nearly as much. So when you look at the disparities and the report uh, focuses on uh, inequalities, w what do you think in terms of the role that uh, government should play? When you're talking about Africa, for example, what is the responsibility of government and are they doing enough? Well, the government has the primary role. The only way that the education system and health system can ever work super well is if the government's collecting enough in taxes and then spending that money, picking the right workers, those workers are showing up, the quality of that work, you know, is the line at the primary health care center is too long? Are they running out of the vaccines when the mothers come a long distance to get there? Uh, you know, all the outsiders can do uh, is help government. Now in a few places like Somalia, the government's not active. So, you know, until the government comes into place, uh, a non-government organization can often work with the villages and create uh, some substitute. But that, you know, that is not the long-term solution. It's by working with the government, helping them build systems, increase their capacity, uh, that the country can uh, be self-sufficient on their own. Now, you, you mentioned Nigeria earlier. You've been a, a strong advocate of uh, vaccine, vaccination and, and also fighting to ensure that children don't have polio. This year, Nigeria marked a milestone, which is uh, reaching three years without polio. Uh, can I have your reaction to that? How does this make you feel? Well, there's a lot of credit to go around. Uh, Nigeria uh, engaged the heroes are the women who went out, went house to house, uh, even up in the northwest, uh, uh, northeast at some risk uh, to their lives in doing that. So it's a wondrous effort. Uh, we're not done. Uh, we have to get to zero cases, uh, and we still have uh, some vaccine 
vaccine-derived cases in Africa, and we still have some wild-type uh, cases in Pakistan and Afghanistan. But here's another milestone where it's been three years since any wild polio cases have been seen in Africa. We worry that you know, it could spread back into Africa from Pakistan or Afghanistan. So we're working intensely there. Uh, but you know, those health systems can be improved. And we learned a lot about primary health care in this effort. And that's why we're engaged, uh, particularly with the states in the north, trying to help them get the vaccination rates up. They start uh, below 30%, whereas some uh, countries are, as they should be, over 90%. And so there are best practices. Uh, you know, I work with Alik and Dan Goti. We're committed to help the, those northern states get their primary health care uh, into a strong position. And speaking of Mr. Dangote, last year you were in Chad uh, to, to also promote vaccination and, and raise awareness against uh, polio. Uh, what did you make of that experience? What did you find in terms of uh, people on the ground? How much do, you, do they understand the need to vaccinate the children and, and the threat of polio really, even when there is no case, uh, the fact that polio remains uh, a latent threat? Well, the number of deaths we could avoid uh, there's from northern Nigeria going east that's the area of the world where still more than 10 percent of the children die and that's partly because of malaria it's partly because the primary health care systems need to be a lot better uh, Chad has less resources there are parts of the country that actually do quite well on vaccination so spreading those practices I think is uh, valuable uh, you know, Mr. Dangote came to Seattle this summer. We spent several days talking about how our foundations are working together to take on nutrition uh, and other challenges. He'll, uh, he and uh, Zawara, who runs his foundation, will be uh, participating in our goalkeepers this year. Okay, and uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 3 aims to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. This is a very ambitious goal. And so how do we get there? How, what, what do you think? Well, the world has made a lot of progress and we're not asking any country to do something that's never been done before. Uh, you know, childhood deaths have been cut in half. Uh, the new vaccines getting out are part of that. Uh, incomes going out, up are part of that. You know, there's a lot of things that correlate with these improvements. Uh, having girls get more education, treating women better so they come together and talk about uh, are they getting the services they deserve, uh, you know, making sure all the mothers understand best practices about prenatal care. Uh, women's groups have been a tactic in Asia Bangladesh and India in particular, and now uh, they're being tried out in parts of Africa in a culturally appropriate way. We're hoping that that becomes a significant tool in Africa as well. Okay. Now, speaking of poverty, uh, there have been a lot of focus on uh, inv an investment over the years in uh, reducing poverty in the world, and uh, the, your foundation has very, be, very much been uh, significant in, in doing that. Uh, yet many people still live in extreme poverty. Uh, so what is a failing poverty reduction uh, in the world? What needs to be done differently, perhaps? Well, in that case, I hope we can retain the incredible progress we've made. We were helped by a number of Asian countries uh, where they, they ran their economy very, very well. So China uh, is now not just a middle-income country, but actually quite a well-off middle-income country. You know, India is far lower income, but they're at that low end of middle income. So those are great examples, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, the world has done quite well on this. The people who remain in extreme poverty are farmers, uh, and a lot of them are subsistence farmers, either in Southeast Asia or Africa. So helping educate them about credit for fertilizer, better seeds, uh, how they can store water, how they can use uh, chickens uh, to supplement their income, particularly if we focus on the women and the, the crops and things that they work on, we can uplift a lot of those farmers. Now, we have the headwind that, you know, sometimes the government's not uh, running good agriculture programs. We have population growth. We have climate change. Uh, so it's not going to be easy uh, to keep 
extreme poverty going down as quickly as it did the last 20 years. Now, uh, you talked about population. The report uh, says that uh, regions uh, in the Sahel, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and, and India uh, have one of the, uh, some of the highest fertility rates in the world. How do you address, when we talk about um, population, how do you address the situations amongst some in the developing world that uh, pr uh, say that uh, Pro promoting family planning uh, may be an attempt to reduce certain population. Well, in fact, the, as countries get healthy, uh, that is, as you reduce the child to death rate, uh, families voluntarily choose to have less children. As you educate women more, families voluntarily choose to have uh, less children. And so what we're about is just making sure people have, on a voluntary basis, access to these tools. And we do surveys on a very regular basis to understand, did you go to find it? Was it stocked out? Did you feel some pressure uh, to use it, which would be inappropriate? And in the history of family planning, there have been cases where governments put too much pressure on people. But the good news is that even without inappropriate pressure, as we uplift families, they will choose to space their births more, which helps a lot uh, with the health, and in some cases, uh, have, have less children. Okay, now uh, speaking of uh, education, the report shows also that the gender gap in education is closing, uh, but will persist in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, for the foreseeable future. So how can this be addressed to improve future outcome in education for young girls? Yeah, so Asia, uh, by and large eliminated the gender gap uh, in both primary and secondary school. Uh, within Africa, there are countries that do better on the gender gap than others. But I'd also highlight that the quality of the learning experience uh, is still something we can do a lot. There are kids who are in school for long periods of time, and yet their ability to read sentences or do simple math is not very good. And so, helping to train the teachers, making sure we're picking the teachers in the right way. We have an, still some work to do on access, uh, particularly at secondary school. But then we also have uh, work to do on quality. And education in some ways is harder than health because in health, if we add a new vaccine, you know, someday we'll have a malaria vaccine, someday we'll have a TB or an HIV vaccine. So you know, I can say that within my lifetime, these infectious diseases will be greatly reduced. In education, it's every day, you know, training the teachers well, making sure they're doing their job well, making sure it's properly funded, uh, making sure the cultural message that yes, the girls should be here uh, and that they have a, a positive, safe experience as part of their schooling. You know, that, uh, you know, every year we just have to get slightly better so we can have education uh, empowering people, and that's really where Africa will thrive. There are a few exemplars, like Vietnam, for its level of wealth, runs a fantastic education system because of the teacher personnel uh, effort they put in. Okay, so in a case like this with education, for example, what is the role of communities? How can they be part of the solution in helping support the work that uh, philanthropist organizations or even government attempt to do to improve uh, the quality of life of uh, communities? Well, education is something where the parents can get involved, whether it's after school programs, uh, you know, talking to the kids that aren't uh, engaging or maybe uh, disruptive, you know, sports programs, uh, demanding to the government that, you know, the right things happen. Communities, I think, are our best bet. Parents, actually, you know, they may not you know, be experts on vaccines, but if their kid's not learning, they should be activated. Uh, and, you know, whether it's at the local level or their federal level, uh, their expectations uh, should be quite high compared to what's going on right now. Okay, now let's talk about climate. Uh, the report talks about climate adaptation. To what extent is it possible to stop climate change or is it adaptation the way of the future? Well, we certainly need to do both. I wish I could tell you that the mitigation effort that is reducing the greenhouse gases would be so successful that we wouldn't have to worry about adaptation. But even in the best case, we will have over two degrees of warming. And so whether it's droughts or 
uh, big heat periods of heat, uh, agriculture in Africa is going to be tougher in the future uh, than it is today. One of the key things from the commission, which I was uh, one of the co-chairs of, along with Ban Ki-moon and several other people, uh, is that we need to make better seeds. The seed research system in the world is underfunded, and yet if we fund it properly, we'll come up with seeds that are more productive and can deal with the heat or the flood or uh, need less water. And, and there's been some progress on that. But you know, Africa, whose agricultural productivity is less than a quarter of, say, Europe or the United States, you know, we can close that gap. And it's a bit about seeds. It's a bit about education. It's a bit about credit for fertilizer. Uh, all those things should allow us to get nutrition levels to improve even in the face of, of the challenges. And the commission, the Global Commission, as you mentioned, says that investing $1.8 trillion over the next decades in five key areas would lead to $7.1 trillion in benefits. What are some of those five key areas? I know you mentioned a few of them. Well, the top of the list is helping subsistence farmers. Most of the very poor people in the world are farmers. Uh, a lot of them are near the equator where the heat uh, is going to be you know, very difficult and some crops are not, you'll have to shift which crops you go, grow uh, in order to, to have high productivity. There are a lot of things having to do with the uh, sea level rise where if you build mango forests, uh, they hold the soil in, uh, they re they're able to reduce the amount of flooding and. Uh, the land loss that takes place. Uh, there's a lot of things about early warning systems. Sadly, you know, we're going to continue to have storms with slightly greater intensity uh, because of climate change, and so the resilience there uh, is very important. Some of the things in the report are fairly inexpensive, like those warning systems, mango forests, even better seeds, a few billion dollars over the next five years will make a, a huge difference there. Some of them, like building seawalls, uh, you know, that's very difficult. Irrigating farms, very difficult. But uh, we're going to have to tackle all of these things. You know, the tragedy is that the poorest uh, who are going to suffer the most from climate change are exactly the people who did nothing to cause it. A state minister, Ethiopian state minister Kaba wrote uh, a letter in which he talks about the Ethiopian experience, how the drought experience in 2015 was as, as bad as the one in 1984, yet the devastation and death was not uh, the same. What lessons can be learned from the Ethiopian experience? Well, Ethiopia, in terms of raising agricultural output and helping their smallholder farmers, really uh, did a fantastic job. Our foundation was lucky enough to be somewhat involved. Uh, the Ministry of Agriculture uh, worked with what they called the Agriculture uh, Transformation Agency. Uh, and so there were a lot of international ideas brought in. A lot of young Ethiopians were brought in to be part of this effort. Uh, and so for a number of crops, uh, the productivity has gone up substantially every year. So even when one part of the country uh, had some crop failure, they were able to take their domestic productivity uh, with government policies and make sure that there wasn't the same type of famine uh, that was very dramatic if you go back uh, to the 1980s. So uh, it is a very hopeful uh, case. Africa can grow a lot more food. So far, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has invested more than $15 billion in projects relevant to Africa. What do you, how do you me measure success and the impact that this investment has made over the years? And what keeps you up at night? Well, we're thrilled at the partnerships we have, uh, working with the uh, countries that give aid, working with the countries in Africa on their programs to support them. You know, our progress in global health is better than we expected. We have a lot of challenges. We're not done with polio. Then once we're done with polio, we'll take on malaria. Malaria deaths are down, but it's still 400,000 kids, mostly in Africa, uh, dying every year. We don't have a lot of the tools. I hoped we'd have an HIV vaccine by now. We'll get one, I think, within a decade, but that's taken longer. Uh, than we expected. 
There are some projects that are at a fairly early stage. This idea of a reinvented toilet. So it's cheap uh, that even in urban Africa, everybody can have a toilet in their own home and it just processes the waste without having a big expensive sewer system. So uh, that uh, you know, may take another 10 years before it, it's really available. Uh, there's even some risk, you know, can we get that price down as much as we want to? So, you know, we're here to partner with the governments. Uh, you know, we you know, are excited that the work has come along. Of course, we worry about, you know, instability and climate change and, you know, all sorts of things that are headwinds for this work. But, you know, the moral uh, importance of this work uh, to help those who are most in need, you know, treat lives as having equal value, uh, that really energizes us. So to the young girl in that small village somewhere with high hopes of having access to education, to the farmer who is going through a drought and hopes that the rain will fall, and to the mother who is fighting to keep her son from uh, catching malaria every day, if they were to ask you, why do you care, what would you say to them? I think everybody cares about other humans. Uh, if those problems were in your neighborhood, as you walked by, you could see the kid with fever and you could see the child who wasn't getting enough food or you could see a child who wasn't able to go to school. You would be, okay, these are my neighbors, I see it. And you know, at that very direct level, you would be emotionally engaged and you would fix it. It is a challenge that these problems are far away and not many people get a chance to go and see both the need and the progress that's taken place. The more people who visit, the better because uh, it's a very rare person who doesn't come back and really deeply affected say, okay, this has got to be more of a priority for me to do whatever we can do to pitch in and, and, and help out. Um, but, you know, in the digital world, we still haven't been able to create that sense that yes, uh, you know, I've met the mother whose child is, is at risk. I've seen these kids who are uh, malnourished. So we're, you know, we're looking for young Africans who can you know, make the case, uh, who can be leaders, uh, you know, really take charge of the continent uh, and figure out you know, where these new tools can accelerate uh, the income improvement and the you know, gender equality, education, uh, the things that, you know, every human on the planet deserves. And finally, Mr. Gates, who is a goalkeeper? Well, the, the goalkeepers are people who picked uh, some part of the sustainable development goals that they are very personally committed to, that they're going to put long hours in, they're going to recruit other people, they're going to create visibility, they're going to think about the role of innovation, perhaps new digital tools, the role of activism, uh, to get their government to uh, pay more attention. We need a lot of goalkeepers. I mean, there's a lot of goals. Uh, they all kind of go together and help each other. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, we've got to energize a whole generation to really be able to achieve those targets. Bill Gates, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.